Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be back after so many months, it's really nice to see you. So, my name is Christian Sasse, this is Sasse Photo and we are live on YouTube and Facebook and today we got a very exciting event. We start with, with some very clever animals. Uh, last time we had Dr. Kevin McGowan, you may remember him from Cornell University online. One sec, I, I just have to check my audio. Give me a second. I have to. We got some. We got some echoes here. Hang on. Okay, I switched off the echoes. That that came in. Uh, my, uh, my apology. That always happens in a live stream. I hope you have no more echoes. If you do, please let me know because I can see the um, your comments. Anyway, let's get right to it. So today. We have the Wildlife Haven Rehab Center. It's really exciting. We are in Canada. We are in Winnipeg, in a very cold area of Canada. It's in Manitoba. I'm just going to quickly show you on the map where that actually is. So I'm just going to jump in and let's see. Get get you get this on the map. There we go. So this is their website. So it's Wild lifehaven.ca that's in Winnipeg um, let's see where the map was here here's the map actually so those of you who don't know where Winnipeg is it's in the southeast corner of Manitoba in Canada and you can see here's a map actually so you can see that's the 49th parallel so actually Winnipeg again is in the very bottom part of Canada. Like most of us Canadians, we live very close to the U.S. border because it gets too cold. We can't move up too far. But even in Winnipeg, it's been really cold recently. I mean, those of you who know uh, Celsius temperatures, it's been all the way down to minus 40. It's really co uh, cold. So those of you who live in North Dakota or possibly Minnesota will understand how cold it can get. Anyway, enough of the cold. Let's jump right back. So that is the website. It's a really beautiful website, as you can see. I can scroll down here and um, I'll jump right in now. One second. I'm going to get our host today online. So this is Alex Cupero. I hope I got your name correct. Alex Cupero. And she's a... Uh, so she's a she's a wildlife photographer too and she's a volunteer at the wildlife haven rehab center there uh, so first of all welcome and thank you so much for coming on our show yeah thank you very much for having myself and ron you guys are going to meet later and today we're very excited to be here <laughs> So, Alex, it was really amazing because a few weeks ago, you were actually the inspiration for me to start my live streams again after months because I was sitting lazily on the couch watching the news and then you suddenly appeared in the Canadian news and I was thought, wow, this is a great topic. You know, we had, we were talking about crows and you were featured there and people were really excited. So, it was all about teaching a crow and that's really what it's going to be uh, about today. So, maybe, Alex, Give us a little bit of background about yourself and also how you came about joining the rehab center as a volunteer, what you do in your life, also as a wildlife photographer, what life is like in Winnipeg. So just keep on talking now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I've been involved with Wildlife Haven for about just over two and a half years now. I'm a full time university student. I'm not in anything related to my volunteer work here. I'm a public relations, communications, and marketing student at the University of Winnipeg, but I have had some spare time on my hands in the last few years, and I've always looked to be involved somewhere and got involved with Wildlife Haven after a family friend, uh, Steve Collinger, sort of talked to me about it. It seemed like a good fit. Wildlife Haven has been around for quite a while now, about 36 years. Originally, it was just started outside of volunteers' backyards. Uh, it was quite small, and over time, it's grown quite a bit. It's seen a few different homes. Um, up till 2019, our recent home before then was in a old dairy barn, and that home was great for, you know, it was donated to us for that time, and it, it was wonderful to have, but it did come with challenges. We did not have running water throughout the whole thing, our volunteers used to have to carry the water throughout the barn, 
barn didn't have heating all the way through. And as you touched on a little bit earlier, it can get pretty cold here in Manitoba. So you have to wear your jacket when you're coming out the volunteer, that was for certain. And there wasn't electricity throughout the entire thing, just the patient rooms. And it, it was much more um, of, of a laborious work, the volunteer work. But in 2019, we are very excited that we were finally able to move into our forever home here in our brand new center, which we've been able to build and it's all designed entirely for the purpose of wildlife rehab specifically. So yeah, we're very excited to be here. Wildlife Haven is a great place and I think the future for it is even more exciting. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a, that's a great summary. I actually saw already what, um, you know, when we were first talking, how beautiful it is in the center. I mean, you have got this wonderful hall, that's your presentation hall, and one could actually look into some of the areas where the, where, where the birds were kept. Is that right? So, Yeah, normally we have this nice background up here today, but we are sitting in what's known as our Murray Education Center, which is where we are able to hold events at the center, to present on wildlife, um, school events all the time here, in normal times and usually there's a little window behind me where you would be able to see ash our great gray owl looks over this room here by the way it's very nice uh, i wanted to say hi to everyone again from youtube and also facebook i see people tuning in from everywhere else all the way to quebec i saw the netherlands so don't hesitate to put your wherever you are into the chat and i also would like to encourage you very much to uh, start asking questions um, so Alex is going to start talking about the, the crow now and the background of the teaching. And then we're also going to see uh, David, the per a young peregrine falcon. And if we have time, it'll also be, uh, we'll have time for a great gray owl. And they are going to be shown live. So lots of exciting things. So Alex, um, I'm just going to jump right in now. And um, let me just adjust this a little bit. One second, I get the eagle back here because I'm going to... Um, uh, you show something where Jet is on your arm now. Maybe you can talk a bit about this. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so this is Jet for those of you who might not be familiar with him yet, but he is a incredibly special bird that we have here at Wildlife Haven. He's our only corvid that we have, so he is an American crow. Yeah. Jet's been at the center for quite some time now. He came to us back in 2010 when he was just a young fledgling. Um, somebody found him, he had injured his wing, possibly fallen from the nest, and with really good intentions. Um, they did take Jet home and they kept him for several weeks while they looked after him. Now, unfortunately, in that time frame, two things happened. One is that his wing uh, did not receive the full care that it needed. They didn't have the medical capabilities at home to help fix it properly. So it healed incorrectly. And the second thing that happened is Jet became what's known as imprinted, meaning that Jet really does not recognize himself as a wild crow anymore. Uh, he looks to people as his companions and his source of resources, which is why you see that behavior in the background right now where Jet is willing to come land on my arm. Um, that's not something crows are gonna wanna do in the wild for you. Uh, that's because he's been living with us here as an ambassador animal for 10 years now. That's absolutely wonderful. How old do crows actually get? How, you know. So in the wild, uh, mm -hmm. the first year of life is the hardest for crows. If it's about a 50% survival rate, I believe, if they make it past that first birthday. But once they live past one, uh, their chances of survival go up quite a bit. And it's not unheard of in the wild for a crow to reach an age of 20, but that's probably you know, a long-lived wild crow. In captivity, that lifespan actually has the potential to double even in some cases, but I'd say 26 is um, up there for a crow in captivity. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Now, crows are also uh, classified as songbirds. Would you take Jet actually to The Voice? <laughs> you know what? Maybe, maybe down the road that'll be his next thing. He does like the talk, and you know he's been known to say a few other things. So that maybe that'll be a future consideration. Let's jump right into some of the training that you've done. I'm going to um, jump into a video now, and you're showing. Can you explain what you're doing? Because you got several ones. This one's called Jet Color Blue, by the way. So yeah, so this is really cool. Um, Jet's trainers 
quite a while ago before I came around. Um, Hillary, she worked with Jet and she was teaching him colors. So he knows his colors, he's known the colors red, green, blue, and yellow for quite a long time now. Um, he's learned those, but in the last few months, we've been working together um, to add in some new colors. And I didn't know how he would take to it because it had been quite a while since he had been working with his colors, but he picked up the new colors really quick. So Jet now knows seven colors altogether. What you see in the background is me holding up his color chips, which are just um, little paint tiles, really, that we have. And I'll offer them to him and say the color name first. And when I tell him which one to pick, I use the word listen, and then I say a color name, and he knows that's the color he should look for, and he'll pull that one from my hand. That's amazing. How long, do, I mean, how do you even start? I wouldn't even know how to start this. How do you even start teaching him such a thing? How, how, how does one do that? Yeah, the way they started was they would just take one color at the start, something that's one color, and you're going to show it to him, and you're going to say red, and you're going to give it to him. And um, by doing that enough, he's going to start to learn that this here means red, the color. And then once he's got that down, you add in a second one, a new color, and you start and you'll show them him both without naming the new one to start. And you'll tell him red, and he's going to know from his learning before, hey, this is red. And once he's got that down, you move on to the next step, which is going to be teaching him the name of the second color, and it just goes on from there. So everything you do with training kids is really all about breaking everything down into many steps. Oh, someone is asking uh, here, are these human years we're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah human, human years. They're human years. I'm going to show some more of your videos now. So I'm just going to jump across where you show them different colors. It's quite amazing. How, you know, I, I wouldn't even know, you know, you're showing him more and more colors. How many colors can he actually see now or distinguish? Yeah, so he, at this moment, uh, he knows seven colors pretty well, <laughs> I would say. Those colors are red, green, blue, yellow, white, orange, and purple. But um, considering how fast he's taken to the new ones, I'm hoping in the next month we'll add another two in. I have chips lined up and ready for him. You know, uh, Alex, I'm thinking of, because I'm always very interested in optics, I'm thinking of very crazy questions. Could crows actually be colorblind? Does one know anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I would guess probably not, but that, that could be incorrect. Yeah, because it's very common, you know, I've seen many people who can't see, uh, distinguish red from green, right? It's a common problem, right? So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Okay, well, well, this is, this is all great. By the way, don't hesitate to ask questions on both Facebook. Uh, we're, we're seeing you both on Facebook and YouTube. And thank you to everyone again for tuning in. I recognize all the wonderful names here. Thanks for coming back. And, um, uh, jumping right back after so many months of silence, so we really appreciate it. So I'm going to jump to the next one where it says Jet Scratches Head. <laughs> what's going, on? What's going yeah. on here? So this would be if Jet had a favorite video he could pick, this would be it. Um, Jet is the only ambassador bird that we actually touch at the center. All the rest of the birds, um, we're very hands-off and, and they would not like that and it would be not appropriate for us to touch our great gray owl. Um, that's not natural for her, but Corvids are incredibly social animals and he comes and he seeks um, human attention and comfort. So this is one of many videos of Jet receiving a head scratch. This is used as part of our training and just also just as good bonding time with him. Um, he would do, I think, just about anything to get a head scratch. And I think he would sit there for probably five hours especially one of his members, Jackie. I'm pretty sure she gives the best head scratches. Uh, that is so, so wonderful. Hey, I don't know if we've shown this. Oh yeah, this one we've shown before. Uh, let's Hi, do this Jet. one Hello. here. You call this Jet Hello Hi, video. Jet. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so you, Hi, in this Jet. video, you guys are gonna hear me say Hi, Hi Jet. Jet. And then Hello. the hello you hear after Hi, that is actually Jet, Jet responding, which is really Hi, cool Jet. in my opinion. Hello. So what this is, Hi, is ministry. Jet. So it's an ability um, Hi, birds like Jet. corvids and ravens have, where Hi, they can Jet. copy Hello. and mimic sounds in the wild. Hi, they can Jet. often use this to mimic uh, the sounds Hi, of other Jet. birds. Hello. 
The Sounds of Predators. Hi, Chet. In that case, though, because he's in captivity Hi, with Chet. people, he has picked up on mimicking Hi, us. Chet. So on cue, he will Hi, say hello Chet. for me, and he will laugh for me as Hi, well. Hi, Chet. And there's been other phrases Hi, in the past Chet. that he used to say, which is pretty Hi, cool. Hi, Chet. Yeah, and, and um, there's a question just, what is the age of the crow? Hi, Jet. <laughs> and, uh, for, Jet for, for Jet, yes. Hi, Jet. Yeah, he came to us in 2010, Hi, so he's Jet. coming up on 11 here. 11, Hi, so he's Jet. still got a long way to go. That's wonderful. Hi, Jet. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, you know, uh, Hi, Jet. Alex, I, we used to, when I was a child, we used Hi, to have an Jet. African grey parrot, and they're very talented Hi, at speaking, you call it mimicking, of course, that's a correct Hi, Jet. term. Do you think crows would have Hi, similar Jet. abilities, or does it really vary? Hi, Jet. It's that mimicry ability is Hi, very Jet. similar. Um, mm -hmm. They've been known to mimic, like Hi, I said, Jet. human voices, text tones, ring Hi, tones. Jet. Um, they've mimicked other birds, Hi, so Jet. that ability to learn words is there. Hi, Jet. And yeah, it's very Hi, unique. Jet. And here's another question. Does Jet Hi, express Jet. emotions, and if so, how? Hi, Jet. <laughs> yes, he definitely Hi, does express Jet. emotions, and it's always very important Hi, that we are remembering that. And uh, Hi, as Jet. a team, we always have to, every day when we Hi, walk in there, think about what his emotions are. Hi, he Jet. has good days, he has bad days, just like Hi, the rest Jet. of us. Uh, he gets upset sometimes, Hi, Jet. and he gets very excited and very Hi, happy Jet. sometimes. So there's a lot of ways you learn Hi, to read Jet. his emotions. Let's jump to the Ready? next video now. This Jet? is uh, called Jet Can Laugh. laugh? Jet? What, what is this about? Good laugh. So this is Jet doing his laugh Ready? there. Can, Can you, you laugh, Jet? Hear me ask him Can if you he laugh, can laugh. Jet? <laughs> and Good that laugh. laugh is his little chuckle after. I think his Ready? laugh is can you laugh, my Jet? favorite. I just find can you it laugh, really Jet? funny. <laughs> Good and laugh. he'll do laughs. And once in a while, he even does Ready? it can you on laugh, his own. Jet? Chuckle at can something. Something off at the ledge. And that always makes me laugh as well. Ready? <laughs> Wonderful. Laugh, and then here's another question. Can you laugh, Have we ever been able to decipher <laughs> when or why they Ready? sing? Can you laugh, no. Jet? When or why they sing? Can you well, laugh, in the Jet? wild, um, they're going to use laugh. that mimicry in the singing to communicate Ready? with can you laugh, most Jet? likely each other, other can you crows. Laugh, Jet? Um, they have large <laughs> social laugh. families and they sort of stick around in groups often. Ready? Can you so laugh, that's Jet? gonna be why you hear them in the laugh, wild Jet? when you hear them crying <laughs> or making a noise. Um, that's them alerting Ready? their family who might Jet? be in the area Can nearby. You laugh, Jet? <laughs> in Jet's Good case, laugh. it's just because he wants to Ready? work with Can us you laugh, and Jet? please laugh. So Can you he laugh, picked Jet? up on mimicking our words. Good laugh. Wonderful. I'm going to jump to the next clip here. It's called uh, Jet Laugh and Call. Can so it's the next Jet? one. <laughs> yeah. So this is just another one. Uh, you can see that he's there and he laughs um, when I tell him to and then he'll come hop on my arm. A uh, very funny story that might be interesting, Jet's mimicry is at our old center when we were still in the dairy barn. He, his enclosure, the way it was facing, he couldn't see out. Um, so he could hear volunteers walking down our barn hallway, but he couldn't see them. And he all on his own picked up asking, who's there? And we actually had volunteers who did not know Jet could talk, and they would be working in the building, and they keep hearing somebody yeah. saying, "Who's there? Who's there?" And some people became <laughs> quite concerned, and they even had called our director, uh, worried someone was in the building. But we were able to reassure the girl. Another question here, uh, Alex: Is Jet male or female? Uh, and and if so, will you let him or her breed? So. As far as I've been told, I'm pretty sure Jet is a male, but the difference between male and female in many birds uh, is very tricky to tell, uh, crows included, so it's really something that you'd have to be an expert or do blood work to determine. Uh, they, they look very similar. The females are a little bit larger, but it's it's very tricky. It's quite different than people. It's not as easy. Um, jet breeding would be a no for us. So we are not looking to breed or reproduce birds. Uh, all our ambassadors are birds that cannot be released to the wild because of various injury or imprinting. So in that case, um, he's going to stay here with us and he's going to represent crows, but we we won't be looking to breed him ever. Excellent. Uh, Alex, I'm just turning down your, I'm just going to comment here if we can turn your volume down a bit. I, I have turned it down. Could you just say something again? I just want to see if it works now. Sorry. No worries. 
Okay, that's too low. Oh gosh, I, I muted you too much. <laughs> One second. Just give me a, a sec to adjust your volume a bit. So we'll, we'll have it. Uh, go on again, please, to say something. Yeah, does it, that yeah. working a little bit better? Yeah, that's better. Perfect. Thank you very much. So next question. Uh, let's see. Um, um, oh, whose laugh did Jet actually learn to mimic? Is that your laugh? <laughs> no, it's not my laugh. So Jet's had uh, Jackie is her name, and she's worked with him for many years. And I think Jackie probably can get the credit for much of Jet's mimicry. He really loves to copy her words. Um, so, yes, yeah, she's the one who established that behavior. <laughs> that's wonderful. I'm going to jump to the next video now. Uh, I think that's just a picture. Wait, let's jump to this one. So he's preening himself, right? Yeah, so this is him actually just after a bath. Um, if you've ever had a dog and they get excited after their bath and they run around, uh, Jet is no different. Once he takes a bath, he likes to run around his room and he goes up on a perch and he preens himself. So that's him just having some fun. That's really good behavior we look for when we're working with him. It shows us he's really happy, really comfortable. So this would be one way that I can read some of his emotions there. And another question. Hi, Alex. What are some of the things that upset Jack, uh, Jet? Thank you. That's a really good question. So Jet is like majority of Corvids, neophobic. And neophobia is the fear of new things. In the wild, crows have this because it actually keeps them very safe. It makes them wary of approaching new situations or putting themselves in dangerous situations. But when we're working with Jet, it's, it can be a very challenging thing to overcome because it means Every single thing, no matter how big or small, that is brand new that we are introducing into his room or his life is a, it's a very big change for him. So uh, he gets a little bit upset when we have to move around even objects in his room. Um, even when I first started using his clicker here, so his training over the clicker training, this was a brand new object. And me having it in the room was something we had to, uh, we had to work through. So. It's just important we always consider that with him. Yeah, and right on that question now, the first one from Facebook. So also on Facebook, don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm reading them here from Pamela. Did you do any clicker training with Jet or did you just use a verbal marker? I think you just answered it. Maybe you can just say that again, yes. Yeah, so Jet's actually, the answer to that question would be both. Um, previously, his work has been mostly verbal, but in the last month or so, we've been switching over to using uh, clicker training and just using the clicker is really to help us, his trainers rather than Jet. Um, well, it will help him too because it's going to make our commands much more um, all the same across the board when we're all working with him. Instead of me saying good job and somebody else saying good boy when he does something right, now he hears the click and he knows that's it. Interesting. Next one, it's called Jet Puzzle. What is this? So just a demonstration of that shows you a little bit of how clever these guys are at solving problems. So we're always trying to keep Jet on his toes and learning new things. And a lot of time, um, his team will come and hide things under objects like you see here. So I've taken three layers of objects and I've put some mealworms under the little blue um, half circle there. And he, it doesn't take him long to unravel everything I do. But wow. it's, it's good to make him think. Wow, excellent. Gosh, so many questions coming in. I hope I can keep up now. <laughs> Does the center have any ravens? Do, you, do they notice any differences, if so, between his, their behavior and Jet's behavior? So we don't have any ravens in our ambassador program, but we do get ravens along with crows in through our hospital that we help uh, rehabilitate. The differences in um, their emotions and stuff, I'm not as the behavior but there are differences between behaviors of crows and wild and ravens in the wild you can look for um, from the calls they make the ravens are known to barrel roll through the air whereas a crow really isn't going to do that so yeah there's quite a few differences you can go into there thanks alex you're doing a wonderful job really thank you so much for answering all the questions there's so some more pouring in do you need foster home care for crows so we do not need foster care uh, homes for crows. It's uh, it's really important to 
actually, especially with crows, many people find them injured and often really want to help out by helping them in our own homes. But unfortunately, just like Jet is an example, of, it's very easy for them to become imprinted, which is why it's really important if, uh, if you can to get them to somewhere like Wildlife Haven, where we have very special protocols and our hospital is designed with special rooms that we make sure we're having minimal contact um, with these guys and we can actually, you know, if we get a couple of crows or a couple of ravens, they can grow up together and it, it keeps them wild. Wonderful. I'm going to show the next clip that you've sent here. It's just taking a bath, which is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, just kind so. of a fun little clip. So you can see that's what it looks like when a crow is taking a bath. Um, I think many people would assume that crows are quite dirty and gross, but he's actually quite clean. Um, he doesn't like to get any dirt on himself. If he ever gets something on his beak, he's going to go and wash it off immediately. Okay, very nice. Kathy is asking here on Facebook, do, crow, do crows like to collect shiny items? That's a great question. I'd like to know that too. That's a really good question. So that is actually quite a bit of a myth. Uh, most likely that myth was started by people who had uh, pet crows or imprinted crows that would pick up their, their keys or crows that got released by people that would go find them. But crows in the wild have no actual you know, preference scientifically towards anything shiny. Uh, they may play with objects just because they're new and Jet as well does not show a preference for anything shiny over something not shiny. Uh, if he does have any preferences, I would say it's probably he likes the color yellow. Really? The co color yellow? I mean, hummingbirds like red, right? So it's very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, think that something could change. Yeah. I think he just seems to like. Yeah, here's another question that goes to the puzzle question. Does Jet actually like solving puzzles to keep himself entertained? <laughs> I, I would hope so. So a lot of the time when I'm done my training session with him, I like to set up a whole bunch of those little puzzles or stacks. Um, ones that I know he can solve without me, I would never leave him something that's going to make him frustrated. But I like to leave them behind so he has a little something to do when he's bored. He solves them very, very quickly. Oh, and, and Pamela would like to know, um, do they recognize, no, sorry, Lucia first, uh, do they recognize humans? If so, how long will they remember them? That's a great question again. Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the things that really make crows unique and corvids in general in their intelligence is their facial recognition ability. So unlike many other animals, crows actually recognize each person as an individual. Uh, Jeff does this at our center. He has people he loves. He has people that he doesn't love as much for sure. It takes quite a while for him to, uh, to get to know people. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Wow, this, this is really exciting. And uh, one from Pamela here, curious, uh, she would like to know, as to the longest chain of behavior that you were able to teach uh, a jet? That's quite a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, the longest chain of behavior. I'm not entirely sure I'm understanding that one correctly, but um, my most recent sort of teachings with jet that I've been doing and working on him, with him is actually trying to get him to work towards painting. Uh, Wildlife ha Haven is having a art auction at the moment Right. And we thought it might be fun to see if Jet would be interested in contributing. Now, we had a very crunch time frame. And as we talked about early, earlier, um, with their neophobia, new behaviors take a lot of time to establish. But Jet did learn to get used to the paintbrush and start grabbing it in his beak and picking it up. And he was able to make a few pieces of art for the auction. Wonderful. I'm going to show this last clip and then we'll slowly move on to the to um, David the Peregrine. Um, so what's what's going on on this one? <laughs> so that one there again, that is Jet just coming to my arm when I'm calling him. Um, and then I'm cueing him with that wave you see me do is yes. the cue for his hello. So he says hello after that and then going back. <laughs> Um, Jet has always been an on-site education ambassador for us. He does not go out to events. Um, he would not be comfortable with that, going outside of his enclosure in new spaces like that would be too stressful. But at the new center, you know, I think we're going to be able to hopefully 
do some outdoor presentations where maybe we can involve Jet from his enclosure there doing the kind of things you see. You know, I'm really enjoying this, uh, Alex. There are such wonderful questions coming in. This is one I can't resist. It's a great question here. My friends who have the channel Pets and Us actually adopted one from a local rehab center in their area. Unlike in the U.S., uh, it is understood here that it is allowed in Canada to keep crows as pets. Is this actually true? <laughs> I, I, as far as my understanding on that goes, I don't think most places in Canada are going to allow you to keep uh, crows as pets. I can only speak on experience in Manitoba here, where crows are protected under the Manitoba Wildlife Act, meaning that we cannot keep them as pets here in Manitoba. Uh, it might seem like they might make great pets, but it's really important at the end of the day that we're recognizing this is a wild species and, and they need to be belonging in the wild. Yeah, um, Alex, I mean, talking about the artwork that uh, that Jet has also been contributing to, I know that, that there's an auction starting now. Would you just be so kind, I'm going to put you on the large screen now so maybe you can show some of his artwork if that's possible yeah let me just grab yeah. them they're just yeah. right to the side <laughs> sure here. sure now, this is quite amazing <laughs> there we go so this is uh this is one of his art pieces there i'll hold it up so you guys can see yeah, it's beautiful yeah it's quite quite well done considering you know it's a new behavior for him so and that's another one of his there that's marvelous. I mean, if people really want to contribute to the um, uh, to, to this, I guess they can go on your website, right? And um, are, it's an auction online, is that right? Yes, yeah, it's an online uh, auction there that they can see all sorts of artwork on it there. And somebody else, uh, Ron's passing it to me here. We actually had one person who was very kind to donate a piece of jet that wow. they painted to our center <laughs> here. So, yeah, they can check that out through wildlifehaven.ca you'll find the auction on there okay i'm just going to put that in the chat just give me a second i'm going to give the links here in both youtube and facebook just give me a second so you'll find everything there there's also by the way a donation if you want to donate something there's also a link and there's also a link that i put in youtube underneath so that just that you know Excellent. There's one more question. Oh, one or two more. You're just pouring in all the time. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> no <This> problem. <laughs> um, oh, this is a great question here from Jody. Here, I used to only feed one crow. Now that I've moved away, I'm still concerned about the health and well-being. Will he remember me? You know. I would bet that he probably would remember you. Um, studies that you can read about on crows and facial recognition show that they remember people for a long time and that they're going to recognize people even far away from where they've met that person so they really do remember faces and um you know they, that that can be a great thing where they're going to remember you positively if you've had great interactions and it also can work unfavorably sometimes too wonderful okay and a gentleman goes from new york very nice to see you again uh, so we're just getting your names in too so we, we're just uh, uh, adapting so if i if we've missed your names but that's going to be the final question then we're going to jump to david uh the peregrine falcon so the follow-up questions so do crows in captivity not sing are they significantly quieter than crows in wild great question huh that's a very good question. Um, Jet doesn't sing often. I wouldn't describe that as being what he does, but he can be quite a no noisy bird. Um, it's, you know, we can hear him down the hallway. He'll sometimes caw, he'll crow. He has a few different sounds. If he hears me in the hallway, but I haven't come to visit him, I'll start hearing hellos from him down the room. So he is very vocal in the center here. I would really like to thank all of you for your questions. I know more questions are coming in, but since these are wild animals, we have to jump on now uh, and get David the peregrine falcon in. So let's go to the next one. This is really exciting too. Yeah, I'll pass you guys over to Ron Tuff, another volunteer here, and he's got David with him. Oh my goodness. So this is exciting. This is Ron now. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to just adjust it here a little bit. There we go. Yes. Oh. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and thank you to Dr. Sassy for having us. And I'm here today with David. He's our little four-year-old peregrine falcon that came to us. He's our most recent ambassador. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about him because he's got a very interesting story. 
talk a bit about peregrines in general, the species, because they're actually quite an incredible bird. I think they're one of the most specialized birds of prey, and I might be a bit biased, but I think that they're one of the most amazing, successful hunters in the world. <clears throat> and we'll talk a bit about um, a little flying at the end, a little flying demonstration of what we've been teaching them. Steve and Amy and I have been doing a little bit of early falconry training, teaching them how to uh, do some falconry maneuvers. Not that he'll ever hunt, because he's not a hunting bird, but we're just teaching him that for demonstration and that. Um, so yeah, David, uh, you can't talk about without talking about the history of the peregrines, because these birds came very close to becoming extinct for a couple of different reasons. Uh, but the main one was a chemical that was back in the 60s, it developed a chemical called DDT that made their eggshells too thin, and their eggshells got so thin that they would uh, break. So he basically uh, is a result of successful breeding. And the story is that when the peregrine numbers plummeted and they were starting to come back, there were breeders across the world, really, that, that helped these birds rebuild their populations. And we we're lucky enough to have a couple right here in Winnipeg, uh, Robert and Nancy Wielden at Parkland News, that's been raising these birds for over 40 years. So David was born a wild bird. He was born a wild peregrine down in Grand Forks and he's born on the side of a building. Peregrines take the buildings quite well. We can talk about that later, but they're actually very, very successful in cities. But he was born on the side of a building. The researchers tagged him. You can see a little red tag, a little black tag on his leg. So they tagged him, they named him. So I think the person that tagged him, his name was David, that's why he got his name. But um, he basically flew the first summer, or first time he flew south, for the winter migration, he survived the first year, which up to 70% can die in year one alone. Flew back up on the second migration, bypassed the states and came to Winnipeg. So he's in Winnipeg. He sadly broke his wing and his, his one wing was broken. Came right here to the wildlife haven. So he was brought in here. They assessed him. They discovered that he could never fly again. So, or not, sorry, not fly again, but he could never successfully hunt again. So uh, Robert in uh, Parkland News took him in as a breeding bird. And the reason he took him in is he looked at the little tag on the leg and he could research back that David's great, great grandfather was actually released by Robert many years ago. So quite an incredible story about it's all come around. He ended up back at Robert's place. Uh, he didn't fertilize any eggs. So Robert called me last summer and he very kindly offered for us to take David in here. And he also, offered to mentor me in the care of these specialized birds, which was absolutely wonderful. So now we have him with us and uh, he's becoming, he's only been with us for just a few months. So he came in October and he's a wild bird. He was never really tamed at all. So he flew a couple times because people are moving around here, but we'll see how it goes today. If he decides he wants to fly a bit earlier, we might change things up here. If he's tired of me talking, so we'll just, we'll just wing it a bit. But anyways, uh, Peregrines in general, like they can look at the at the bird, he's an absolute marvel. A lot of you know that they are the fastest animal in the world by far, but um, they actually, uh, their anatomy on their beak is the reason why jet engines were successful. They couldn't even figure out why jet engines weren't working. And when they actually studied the peregrine to see how it can breathe at these great speeds that it flies at, they could see that on his nose, the bill is a little tiny baffle that stops the air, keeps it from moving around and, and, and suffocating the bird when it flies. So they replicated that baffle in the jet engine. So by studying this little bird, they actually discovered how to make a jet engine. And if you look at him up close, I'll see if he'll come close to the camera for you a little bit. Uh, he may be okay looking at himself. He may not like it. I don't know. But these little guys, first and foremost, their eyes. Most incredible eyes in the animal kingdom. These guys have twice the vision of a hawk. They can see at a distance proven of three kilometers, a small little object being thrown up in the air. And they need those incredibly powerful eyes just because their hunting technique, their eyes are crucial to their success. So they've got highly specialized eyes. They've got, like other birds of prey, they have two fovea, two focus points on their eyes, whereas every other animal has one. They can see close up, they can see far with exquisite vision. On his bill, He's got uh, a little sharp little hook towards the bottom of the bill. Can you grab that ox that fell down there? He's got a sharp little hook on the bottom of his bill, and that's called a tomeal tooth. I'll show you a little picture in a second here. But he flew on and blew it away here. It's just right there outside. Okay. Sorry. Uh, he flew away a little bit on me. 
So they have a little sharp little corner on the side of their bill there. And this little tooth that they have, he actually keeps, thank you. It actually helps them chop right through the neck of their prey. So that little arrow on the bill is a little tomeal tooth. On their nostril, that's yes. a little valve inside there that helps them breathe so they can breathe when they're flying at these huge speeds. There's a comparison of the size of the eyes in a bird of prey. 75% of the skull is just eyes. So they've got the amazing eyes. They've got amazing, amazing feathers and very sharp streamlined wings that allow them to fly at really high speeds. These guys have been clocked. Uh, National Geographic clocked them at 390 kilometers top speed. So they are by far the fastest creature on earth. You look at his feet, he's got dagger-like one-inch talons that are extraordinarily sharp. He's got long, long toes that allow him to grasp his prey from a distance. And his whole body is built for speed. So these guys have got so many things about them that make them successful. And uh, like I say, they, they, the stoop is their iconic maneuver. When you hear about them going hundreds of miles an hour or kilometers an hour, they go into a dive where they'll dive straight down tuck their wings in and do something called a stoop. And if you look at the image of a peregrine compared to a B-2 stealth bomber, they're eerily the same. And that was sort of modeled after the speed of a peregrine. So these birds, nature shows us the best. And these guys are, in my opinion, amongst the best in the animal world. What makes them special? What's their behavior so special? Well, they'll do things like pirate prey from other birds. They're such exquisite flyers that a bird could be flying by with uh, an item of food and they would fly by at a great speed, go upside down and what we call pirate the food, take it away from another bird, which is really, uh, I don't think there's any species that do that. These guys are widespread. They're actually on every continent of the world, except Antarctica. The word peregrine means wanderer or pilgrim, and that's where they get that from. They just wander over the entire world. He's very, very sharp. His eyes are watching everything. so. Sometimes if someone goes by outside the window, he sees it, he's, he's still a little shocked, but he's still doing remarkably well considering he's only been with us for a few months. It's a very, very slow process treating, them, treating the birds and getting them trained. Like Alex said, it takes endless patience. We have a trainer here, Terry Egan, who's been with us for a long, long time. And I've been here a few years and, and Terry's watching him and his patience and his love for the birds. It's rubbed off on all of us. So really uh, uh, a labor of love teaching this little guy. Ron, and, you, uh, Ron, you start coming up, Dr. Shaz, you feel free to call up questions. If yeah, you, like. you, you, you're absolutely amazing. I just wanted to say thank you so much. This is a very, you are so passionate about what you do. It's such, it's incredible. So people are very, um, all, all the audience is delighted. They just wanted to say, uh, you can tell Ron, we love raptors here at your channel, including Osprey Mama. She is the moderator there on YouTube. And yeah. uh, so, they really appreciate it. And one question that comes in here, uh, if he sleeps, how long does he actually sleep? Oh, they'll, uh, they'll at nighttime when they nestle down, I think they'll, when it gets dark out, they'll just kind of pretty much the whole night they'll stay. These raptors won't fly when it's dark out. They'll only fly when they can see. So when it gets dark, they'll nestle down. And hour wise, don't really know, but I know that they're pretty dormant and quiet from the sign the sun goes down. Some birds have eyes that allow them to see at night, like the owls. These guys do not. So when it gets dusky or dark. Uh, interesting fact, this is one of the most successful birds that's actually taken to cities. Some of the reasons are they can, uh, you know, they can actually hunt pigeons. There. Their favorite food is pigeons. So they'll hunt pigeons in the cities, lots and lots of pigeons. They will nest on the sides of the buildings because they like those tall skyscrapers. They're much like, um, their cliffs in the natural world and in some cities like chicago they can fly at night because the lights are out so they actually like that at night time and uh here you go little buddy <laughs> is he's that right patient. he's been the very patient he's been a very good boy well, there's a there's a very interesting question coming in here or a comment. I think live cams have taught us so much about the behaviors of of peregrine falcons. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, we, in Winnipeg, we have uh, cameras set up on the nests here because they, when they nest, they'll show the birds actually nesting on the sides of the buildings, watching the babies hatch. Quite fascinating. And the webcams, of course, all around the world now, you can watch wildlife everywhere. Now he's got his, uh, piqued his interest on the food, so I think we have to do it. <laughs> he's starting to, but um, Robert showed me a lot of training. Part of the training we do is 
the thing called a lure. So if this bird was born to us and we brought him up for a youngster, we raise him to the lure and he'd become very, very attached to this. Every time he saw it, he thinks of food. And that's how falconry, falconry is an is a art that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. People hunting with birds is known as falconry. So we're training, I'm training David to go to the lure. And eventually when we get outside, we'd like to be able to fly, of course, a lot further distance and have him fly person to person. But step number one is just getting him flying to a lure. So here he is. And when we start out early, when we start doing this, let's see if we can see him here. So I just gotta move just a little bit there. So the beginning stages is just getting him to recognize the lure, recognize the food, and I'll train him to go to it with a whistle so that every time he hears a whistle, he'll know that he has to go. And he'll start looking around for the, the lure, wherever it might be. And so we start out slow, start out just getting them close and then move further and further back. And he'll go back 15, 20 feet now and have him come up. Up, up, up you go, buddy. What is he, what is he, one question is, what is he eating here? He is eating up some chopped up chicken. Okay. Yeah, so he's oh. eating a bit of chicken. These are birds are, are, are eaters of uh, other birds. So we try to feed him a diet as close as we can. We'll feed him chicken and things like that. But, and, here, uh, and here's another question. Do they get pestered by other birds like crows the way uh, uh, bald eagles do? I would say not to the same degree. I think that they, uh, certain birds are more predation on the nest. They, they don't, I don't see them get harassed quite this way, but they will. So, that is um, marvelous. Yeah, marvelous. and now I've got him trained to come back quite a distance too. So he'll come back, uh -huh. you know, 15, 20 feet as well. Somebody. Somebody. He's not used to looking at the camera either. Come on, my friend. So with anyways, with Paul Cabri, once you train them to the lure, and he's getting very good with the lure, then you can move outdoors and you can start moving the lure and you can start teaching them to successfully hunt in the wild too. But, um, oh, yeah. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny wants to know, how does he measure up to jet as far as problem solving and other smarts are concerned? Oh. Yes, good question. Yeah, I think a uh, very good question, Jenny. Uh, what? I've always been amazed at the hidden intelligence of animals because they're just starting to understand so many secrets that the animals have an intelligence that we don't know how to measure. And Jet's intelligence is eerily close to human, whereas his intelligence is, is really survival instincts, prey, hunting. Um, wouldn't be able to do any of the interesting things that you're showing uh, Alex is showing with Jet. He's not really of that sort of uh, nature. Um, training him to hunt, he could hunt quite successfully. These are amongst the most common birds in falconry because they're easy to train and they're uh, really, really good hunters. But no, his, his intelligence wouldn't be on the same scale of that. that Jet's more human-like, I would say. Interesting. And Terry is asking, are their eyes fixed in the socket where they have to move their head in order to see the peripheral? Yeah, good question. So the, the skulls of, of these birds are fixed in the head. Uh, in the eagles and the hawks, there's a little bony ring around that actually holds the eyeball fixed. So the eyes can't move, which is why owls and some birds can turn their heads most of the way around. And that bony ring allows muscles to attach to the eye to really pull it in certain directions to allow rapid focusing. So the eyes are fixed. They're huge to allow a lot of light in. And they, they take up a great portion of the skull. So yeah, like I said, these guys, the eyes is absolutely crucial to their hunting success. And uh, peregrine, if you want to see a peregrine in the wild, they've got sharp pointed wings that you might have seen as he raised his wings up. Very sharp pointy wings, um, very unique. There's several birds that look like them. He's a male, so he's uh, smaller than a female. The females would be much larger in all of these birds. The females exhibit what we call sexual dimorphism. So. The females are much, much larger. Uh, most other animals, it's reverse, of course. He's being a very patient boy, aren't you? You're being a very good boy. And we don't touch the birds like Alex said, but like Robert showed me one time, they do sometimes like to be stroked with a feather, kind of calm them down at times, and make them feel 
That's a good boy. You're doing good. Yes. It's his first show. He says, <laughs> hasn't actually met anybody since he came here, so it's quite, quite good. What wonder, good questions, wonder. people. Good questions. Yeah, that's a good boy. He's got a healthy appetite. Yeah, someone was just asking, is that an owl skull skull that you just showed? That is an owl skull, yeah. Yes, so the yes. owls and the raptors, they're similar. The owl raptors have massive eye cavities compared to the brain. I picked that one out specifically just because it had a bird is a bird of prey. But of course a peregrine would be a slightly different type of skull. But it's to, just to exhibit the actual idea of how big the eyes, the eyes and brain take seventy five percent of the skull. You know, it's, it's quite uh, interesting, uh, Rob, because um, we have quite a diverse uh, wildlife area out here in Boundary Bay. By the way, Pacific, wild, uh, Pacific North Ca uh, West Cate, uh, Pacific Northwest Cate, who's also with us, she's out there every single day and she takes these incredible um, uh, videos, actually, where you can see a lot of Dunlins. It's very unique for the Boundary Bay area. And you see peregrine falcon... Uh, uh, hunting them, uh, typically uh, during high tide, uh, because in uh, where where they just uh, seem seem to um, move in you know for hours across the bay, and it's it's quite mm -hmm. amazing. And sometimes you can see when a peregrine falcon uh, actually attacks them. It's been studied uh, quite uh, um, you know qu quite intensely for years. Uh, yet their success rate, I think, as far as I've read, is only something like 10% or lower. So for every time they come in, for every 10 times they, they, they dive, they only come back once. So there's a lot of expenditure, right? Is yes, that something? quite right. Yeah. Quite right. Yeah, they're, mm -hmm. they're uh, in the first year of life, up to 70% of these guys will die. You know, it's a huge mm -hmm. percentage will die. And yeah, it takes ex tremendous expenditures of energy and... Their prey item, the prey animals that they're preying on are really well adapted to getting away. And that's the reason that they're successful. So he is just wanting more and more. You're running out of food, buddy. Uh, but yeah, they do They do many, many, many hunts until they get a successful hunt. And, uh, you know, the ones that's successful in the wild, like David, he's very food motivated because he probably came close to starvation many times in the uh, in the wild whereas the domestic birds we've raised they're kind of nonchalant for food, but he would keep eating all day long interesting find that robert had shared with me <laughs> and uh and their talons like talons of a locking mechanism so you can see on my thumb there if he dug that in there's almost like a little ratchet mechanism on the on the bone so when they grab that talon will dig in and then it's ratcheted down they don't have to use any clenching strength to hold it and latch you just hold there with the ratchet mechanism on those long toes that's it it's ab absolutely incredible is that the only peregrine falcon you have uh, at, at the rehab center yeah we have another peregrine chinook that's been with us for about 12 years and chinook is uh female and uh jen is working with her and making great progress and it's um it's tricky. All birds are different, and they're all they just, they're not like training any other animal. Or, um, it takes endless patience, like to do just what I just did today, take months. <laughs> it was baby steps. He did not like coming to be handled. He did not like coming to be with humans. So, uh, and typically he's not out of his cage that much that long. Are you going to get Ash? I'm going to say Alex is going to probably round up Ash because David's very patient, but he's okay. So I just about oh. she's just to get ash but you'll notice when i'm holding them yes i have to hold my hand at a bit of an angle he's got such long toes when sure. alex brings ash in her small little feet can hold up quite comfortably like this whereas he's more on a, at a stream angle and uh yeah he's these little things around his ankles are known as jesses he's got the little leather anklets around his ankles then he's got leather bands called jesses which is all held onto this little leash called a creance line and eventually when we move outside we'd like to have this you know have him flying further and further and further and and uh, it's good for him and i think the progress we've made i can i think you can keep getting better and better all the time okay for, yeah sorry no no i just thought if if it gets too much for for david now maybe we should move on uh, to to the great uh, gray he's, 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 he does it's okay you know, he's not he's not upset at all he's just he's gonna start flapping a little bit but she's getting she's getting that uh, Ash right now. I just ran out of food for him. <laughs> <laughs> just a quick question. You're just from wants more food. Just a quick question. You're from Pilotman. How many eggs in a clutch typically? 
Uh, about three to five. Oh, yeah. three to five, and, right. Uh, well, here comes Ash. I am going to slip off to the side, Alex. Do you want to come in this way, Alex? Okay. I'm actually going to slip out of the screen for a minute, and then Ash will come in because okay. these two birds are not super friendly with each other. And if there's any other questions that come up, you can certainly ask them after, too. But I will bring him back because he's he's been very patient, boy. But it's the first time you've seen anybody, so thank you for seeing him. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. All the effort you put in, we really appreciate it, Ron. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, I see a question from Nancy who says, "Isn't it peregrines that affect the shape of murmurations?" You know, uh, Nancy, we, I'm going to actually have a separate broadcast from an expert. Uh, who studied uh, uh, who studied peregrine falcons and the behavior with dunlins and so on over decades, and that's going to probably be the next uh, the, the the next topic. So we're going to that's something that Pacific West Northwest Kate has looked at, but we're going to get it from a person who studied them over decades. So that'll be next time. So let's jump. Oh, here, look at that. Here's Alex. Yeah, so here you're back with a bigger crow. <laughs> yeah, this is. A so this is Ash here. She is our great gray owl ambassador at Wildlife Haven. She came to us two years ago. What happened with Ash is somebody found her on the side of a road. Why she was there on the side of the road, we don't know exactly. With very good intentions, they took her home and they were actually keeping her at home from when she was baby, um, raising her, feeding her fried chicken and all sorts of things that really are not part of a great gray owl's diet. Um, so eventually somebody found out and conservation um, went and brought her to the center here. Now during her time with those people, unfortunately, same as Jet, uh, Ash became what's known as imprinted. So she no longer recognizes herself as a great gray owl. She's one of our friendlier birds we have here at the center. So there's no letting her go to the wild, but we are very excited to have her here as part of our team. Um, the great gray owl is very Manitoba specifically where we are uh, because they are Manitoba's provincial bird so we love talking about them. Wow that's she's so beautiful also to see the size comparison how heavy how how, ev how heavy is he or she I, I don't know. Yeah so she's quite deceptive she, she looks very big uh, it doesn't help that I'm also not all that giant so she <laughs> looks very big but she only weighs about uh, two or three pounds really she's not heavy at all. Now, part of what that is, is the amount of feathers these guys have. So she has over 10,000 feathers on her body. These are very important for helping her survive here in the harsh Manitoba winters, but they also make her look much bigger. Uh, the owl skull that Ron brought out earlier here, we can take a look at again. And if you think of that, her skull is about the same size as this one. But when we look at that compared to her head here, <laughs> even putting it a little bit in front, you can see there's a whole lot of feather going on there. So if you were able to see just her body, it'd be much, much smaller. Well, she definitely has the head turned around the wrong way. <laughs> no, it's really funny. I mean, I think I saw about a 190 degree turn there because it went more than 180. It's just, I get very jealous of this. You know? <laughs> yeah, so these guys can turn their heads, owls, 270 degrees. So it's not quite all the way around, but still very, very far if we were to try and imagine doing that with their own heads. Uh, part of how they get this ability is the amount of vertebrae they have. So she has double the amount of vertebrae that we have. Uh, humans have seven vertebrae in our necks and she's got 14 in her neck. Um, right. So quite a big difference and that's really helps give that range of mobility. I think you guys heard Ron talk a little bit about how raptors have eyes that are fixed in their head. So her eyes are wherever her head is facing, that is exactly where she is looking. Unlike you or I, that we move our eyes side to side, um, they do not have that ability and that's why they turn their head so far around. Right, and the question here from Osprey Mama says, do they let her mate? No, so same as Jet um, and all birds in our program. Um, any bird that's in the Wildlife Haven program is not gonna be reproducing. Um, they're only here to represent their species, and we're not looking to have more captive bred ones. But in the wild, Manitoba has um, populations of great gray. And um, what, what was, it? sorry, let's talk a bit about their vision. I mean, something I'm very intrigued about is, is of course, the, the, the owl vision. Um, is, there, is there anything you can tell us about their night vision? 
Yeah, so these guys have incredible vision. A lot of that comes from the size of their eyes that are in their skull there, as Ron in, uh, showed with the skull. It takes up a large portion of it, and their eyes are shaped quite differently than humans. Our eyes are rounder, whereas theirs are almost more cone-like shaped in some regard, where they're elongated back into the skull more. That's what takes away the range of mobility and gives them much better eyesight than we have. And uh, they can see much better during the day and night than we can. Now, uh, great greys hunt both during the day and nighttime. They're diurnal, I believe. So you'll often see these guys in the daytime out and about on high perches looking for their favorite food here in Manitoba is the meadow vole. Whereas some other owl species like the great horns are less likely to be spotted in the daytime, but you might find them uh, at nighttime a lot more active. I mean, one, one thing that intrigues us, of course, you know, especially because um, we do a lot of live broadcasts uh, on eagles, uh, Alex, is, is that we know that there are certain nests, for example, in Florida and also well, here in British Columbia, um, where, the, where uh, we've seen that where we have webcams uh, at eagle nests, it seems that some uh, that great uh, grades actually attack the eagles. So there, there seems to be a hypothesis that it is possible that mm -hmm. the great uh, gray or some owls can actually see the the far red or the near infrared light that is emitted by these cameras to illuminate uh, the, the nest at night, which eagles or also humans cannot see. It's just a statement. You know? Yeah, that's that's very cool. I'm not too familiar with that, but it, it wouldn't shock me. Their capabilities are quite astounding. Okay, next question, general question. Uh, gentleman Ghost again, hi, back in New York. So how segregated do you have to keep all these different bird types? Do you have to keep any breed separate because of hostility? Great question. Go, please. That's a very good question. So all our birds at Wildlife Haven, we don't have any birds um, currently that we house together. They're all housed individually um, just for their own safety and preferences. We don't have any birds that have shown that they prefer to be around each other, especially the bird like Ash, uh, who is human imprinted. And really, she lacks that understanding. I, I cannot clarify that enough that she is a, a great gray owl. She is terrified of our other birds. She's our biggest bird we have here out of our owls, um, besides our eagle. But she, our small little Mississippi kite, could be on the other side of the room. And she will pop up and, and do a full mantle display, which is a sign that she's scared and trying to make herself look bigger because she does not like the other birds. So we keep them all separate. How interesting. That's, I, I wouldn't have expected that. Thank you. Pacific Northwest Kate comes here with a question. Is she a day hunter or at night? So Ash is not a hunter at all. Uh, if we were to let her go in the wild, she would not make it. I, I can promise you that. Um, she really does not have that ability anymore or understanding that she needs to go after things in that way. But in Manitoba, when I have been out uh, photographing great grays or looking at them, I've seen them active during the day is when I found them and seen them catching meadow bulls during the day. Thank you, Alex. My goodness. You, you, uh, again, thank you so much for, for putting up such a great show here live. It's, it's quite amazing what, what you've prepared. Tufts is saying, is she normally dormant during the day? Ash, uh, she's actually more active than some of our other birds during the day. She'll move around between our, her perches and her room. She'll come check out what's going on. If we're in there sitting with her, um, we make sure we give our education ambassadors lots of enrichment, um, spending time with them. And she'll come sit on your lap or come check out what you're doing in the room. She'll be right on the perch near to you. So she's quite interested. Um, I'm not too sure how active she is at nighttime. I'm not here during that time, so I, I can't speak on that too well. <laughs> okay, David Gates here from Facebook is saying, or asking, does she beak clack? Does she beak clack? She has sometimes, uh, especially when the other birds are in the room. That's her letting us know that she is very unhappy with them. So she she will clack her beak when she huffs, uh, puffs up with them, and, and that's a display of... Uh, I don't think it's as much aggression with her as much as it's really, she's quite scared of the other birds. Thank you. And Lucia is asking, what other regions are can they be found? So these guys can be found, uh, I know that they can be found in Europe as well as Canada, but 
I'm mostly familiar with where they are in Manitoba, but they're not much further down south. So they're, it's exciting for us to be able to talk to them because they're a little bit more unique than some of our further wider spread species like great horned owls that are found all over the place. And Terry is saying, is she vocal at all? Thank you, because she's so quiet. <laughs> she is vocal. She's often quite quiet, but sometimes we'll hear this quiet little hooting. Um, it's a really low sound and very soft um, compared to the great horned owls we have. And, and you'll hear her once in a while making those noises. Or when you bring her something new, if you're letting her check something out, sometimes she'll make these little chirping noises almost as she chortling type things when she checks them out. But she's overall a fairly quiet bird. Pacific North Qu uh, West Kate again. Can you teach her things like what you do with Jet or with David? <laughs> <laughs> we could teach her to some degree, but owls actually are often interpreted as being very wise myth, but that is not quite the case um, <laughs> compared to hawks and falcons okay. and especially corvids like Jet the Crow. They are much lower on the IQ scale, so training-wise that can offer a little bit more of a, a challenge, but they, they can be in circumstances trained to do things. And Dana says, she's a lap owl, question mark. Wow, what an awesome job uh, job you have, Alex. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very unique experience to be involved here at Wildlife Haven. I'm very grateful to be a volunteer. And Blue24, how many feathers does Ash have? Do you think, I think you've answered that, do you think or can you guess, for example, Bald Eagle has 7,200 feathers and maybe it's similar size, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they say over 10,000 feathers mm -hmm. on the body of a great gray owl. So I certainly don't know how many ash has, and I'd be here for a very long time trying <laughs> to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's a lot. It's what keeps them insulated here in the winter. So uh, just my own questions. are anybody, uh, are, uh, Except for Jet, is anybody else participating in, in, in this um, art exhibition from, from the raptors? Or. Yes, so Leo, who is a newer volunteer, uh, a newer bird of ours, a volunteer, <laughs> um, he's a turkey vulture and he contributed some art for the auction as well with Amy, our education coordinator. She did a great job working with him and, and getting him to do those. Oh, that's amazing. I'm just going to try and, uh, one second, I'm going on your website uh, and see if I can show the link to the. Uh, to the art exhibition, I'm not sure I can find it at the moment. Let me see. It's on. It's on the. It's on the web page, right, uh, Alex? Yes. Yeah. Through wildlifehaven.ca, there's a little spot. Uh, I think right on the home page, there's a portal to it. There, you'll see art. We've done, and it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, many artists have come forward to contribute and donate pieces to us, which we're very grateful for. Okay, I, I, I just saw, I, I'll, I'll have to put you in the upper corner for a second uh, so I can show this at the same time. Um, do you know where it is? So I'm just scrolling down. I don't know oh, if you... It's uh, that, that little art for wildlife. Oh, there we are. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Oh, here we are. I'm just going to put this link here in both the chat so people can see this. So if you're interested, this is this marvelous auction that... Uh, uh, I've never seen anything like that, that Alex was talking about. Very nice. Great. Okay, that's good. I'll put you back on the screen now, and I'll also put it into the Facebook page so people have it. One second. Yeah, if anybody's interested in seeing more content with Ash as well, she was actually featured on our uh, Wildlife Haven That's So Wild Kids show this morning, and they did a, a little live Q&A there, but that can be found on the Wildlife Haven that's so wild uh, YouTube channel as well. It's uh, great little videos that have been produced at the center here recently for children, just offer some educational content. Very nice. Well, thank you, Alex. I, th I think, wow, we've done more than an hour now and uh, y you and uh, Ron have been absolutely magnificent. So I really would like to thank you. I mean, this has been, been absolutely wonderful. So... <laughs> really wonderful to get to get this channel started again i really want would like to thank you again it's also possible to do donations so please feel free and um, generous to give donations to this wonderful uh, rehab center it's got such a very nice name wild wildlife haven rehab center what a name 
and uh, it's a great job that you're doing and everybody is really excited just like I've been and we're very grateful that you took so much time. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very <laughs> much for having us here. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to um, blend you out now. Thanks so much, Alex, for all your time here. And um, then I'll just uh, sign off everyone and then we'll, <laughs> we'll close it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I really appreciate that there were so many questions that made this this that makes puts this channel back to life by the way i wanted to say that uh, next time i will be trying to do something with an expert i won't tell you yet who it is but it's very exciting uh, probably together with eagle biologist david hancock talk a little bit more about the behavior of murmurations and dunlins and peregrine falcons and and many other raptors uh, in the area of Boundary Bay and others, and how they actually hunt. There's been, uh, this has been, been observed for many decades. So if this is something you're interested in, I think it'll be a great topic. Uh, it's also something that Pacific Northwest K, she's always out there every day. She puts this on her beautiful channel. Uh, and you, you, can, you can see that too. She's got her own YouTube channel. It's very nice to see that, by the way. Okay, on that note, I would like to sign off and thank you very much for, for, for being here. And if you have any topics of interest, if you know of anybody who would like to be interviewed, just let me know. I'm very happy to take it up. So I suggest probably every two to three weeks I'll be doing a live broadcast, not too many because otherwise it gets too much. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever I'm out, I'll be showing you more. If you're interested, by the way, in uh, seeing some live things that I do on hummingbirds, I've recently published something on hummingbirds from my own garden, let me know. And I might do a live show on hummingbirds too, although it's a bit more difficult than doing this with a rehab center because these hummingbirds, I let them do exactly what they want, right? So sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. And it takes days and days of patience to show what they actually do in slow motion. On that note, thank you very much. I would... Um, I wish you a wonderful weekend. So I'm going to sign off first to everyone on Facebook. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And then we'll go to YouTube very quickly and I'll sign off there. Thanks for being with us and goodbye from Christian from Zasafoto. Thank you.